here. It's good to be here with you after a really exciting few days for the Texas Rangers, adding four veteran players to the organization. Cole Calhoun on a one-year deal, John Gray on a four-year deal, uh, Marcus Simeon on a seven-year deal, and Corey Seager, uh, the biggest move of them all, on a 10-year deal. Those four contracts totaling in value north of $500 million, uh, the largest investment when you consider just the totality of the contracts uh, that were signed that the Rangers have ever made. So first of all, let's just get something out of the way here. This idea that the ownership uh, is not invested in winning, they're not going to invest in the team, we need to now throw that in the trash can. Uh, whether you love the moves or not, uh, what cannot be argued is that the ownership group stepped up in a big way and they invested a lot of money. And by all accounts, they're not done investing money in this roster. Uh, is there going to be another huge addition contractually before the start of the season probably not maybe someone like a Clayton Kershaw and we can get into that in another video uh, there could be some big names who maybe aren't getting paid what you would expect because they're still in arbitration the Rangers could acquire in a trade like a guy like Matt Olson for instance but I think next off season uh, the Rangers are also going to be in a position to maybe not uh, dish out 500 million plus dollars worth of contracts, but another big time deal like a Simeon type deal or a Seeger type deal. So let's let's start with that. Uh, you know, a tip of the cap uh, that you know this ownership group stepped up, and the Rangers are in the position that they're in with now two All Star players uh, serving as the pillars of of the next chapter of Rangers baseball. Uh, all right, so where are the Rangers now? Uh, they are a better team than they were at this time last year, and they will likely be a better team in 2022 than they were in 2021. And let's be real, 60-win uh, season is not a, a, a high bar to, uh, to have to clear. The Rangers are not yet going to be considered a World Series contender. Uh, and my guess is that when Vegas releases the odds for uh, the upcoming season, the Rangers won't necessarily be considered a favorite for the playoffs. Uh, now, this all depends on how many playoff teams there are with the collective bargaining agreement uh, you know, being discussed, or I guess maybe not discussed at the present time with the lockout. Uh, perhaps they expand the playoffs, but if you assume the most recent playoff structure uh, Rangers would probably not be a favorite for the playoffs. However, they are now in a position where the idea of anything can happen is kind of realistic. Uh, you know, the Rangers are going to be more competitive. They're going to be in the mix and likely will be playing meaningful baseball after the all-star break, which we really have not been able to say uh, perhaps since 2016 In 2019, the Rangers went into the all-star break kind of, in the conversation, but it did seem fleeting and the Rangers were prepared to sell. Uh, that's not going to be the case this year. They, they might sell, but if the Rangers are in contention, they're not going to sell if that makes sense. So remember the Rangers just lost over a hundred games. Uh, you don't in baseball go from that to world series contender overnight. It is incredibly tough to do. This is not the NBA where you get one superstar and it changes the complexion of things or the NFL where you get, uh, you know, a quarterback who's just a, a transcendent player and it changes the complexion of things or hockey where if you get in the dance and you got a goalie who gets hot, look out. Uh, the Rangers have taken not steps, but they've taken a leap in the right direction. This is merely another step towards where they want to go. And that's why, uh, you know, this is not a finished product and that's acquiring more talent in, in the trade market. You know, the Rangers are going to have more opportunities. We'll get into that in a second. That's obviously the draft that's coming up, having the third overall pick and continuing to bolster the farm system and the growth of the guys they have already in the organization, whether it's guys who have played in the majors uh, or guys who have yet to play in the majors who could be a part of the future. And then of course, that's also continuing to supplement the roster in free agency. So uh, there's a lot of excitement and I don't want to kill the, the, the party of the vibe, but if your expectation is, well, now the Rangers are a world series contender and well, let's be, let's be realistic. 
uh, with where they were and where they are now and, and understand that this is still uh, a, a process of growth. And maybe the Rangers make the playoffs, maybe they don't. If the Rangers do not make the playoffs, this year is not a failure. These signings are not failure signings. Uh, the Rangers are not all in in 2022. Again, it is still about growth. But now I think you can look at 2023 and indicate that that is a year in which the Rangers could very well go into the season as if not favorites to be playoff uh, participants right on the cusp. All right. What's next? So I mentioned more money. Uh, the Rangers do have more money to spend, whether it's this off season uh, or subsequent off seasons. Again, this off season, probably not a huge big time contract. Uh, you could see maybe, you know, I don't know what Clayton Kershaw's market will be. Maybe it's 20 a year. Maybe it's 18 a year. You could see something like that. I think the Rangers have probably between 20 and $30 million annually to give out this year. So what I mean by that is, you know, they could sign a guy to a hundred million dollar deal over five years. That's 20 million annually. And they still probably have another five to $10 million that they could spend for this upcoming year that they'd be comfortable giving out. Uh, that could come in the way of, you know, taking on a contract in a trade, a Matt Olson or uh, a Luis Castillo or a Tyler Malley. You know, a lot of people have talked about possible uh, matches there. It could be, you know, you know, three or four role type players, veteran role players to, you know, add some depth in the outfield or uh, supplement the, the rotation. Uh, and one thing that's that's worth noting is when you acquire Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon, Seager for 10 years, Simeon for seven years. It doesn't make your, it doesn't, uh, you know, render your prospects, you know, those positions obsolete uh, because you never quite know what's going to happen. And, and maybe, you know, a particular player has position flexibility and you turn him into an outfielder because man, that bat is just so good. But the reality is the Rangers have a ton of depth in their infield in the minor league system. You know, when, when people talk about the Rangers having a deep system, the, the infield crop, particular second, third shortstop that might be uh the the, the area of, of the most depth and now that makes the rangers really interesting trade partners because they have guys they'd be willing to part ways with uh who are of value and interest to other organizations so just you know be be mindful of that uh how did the rangers get them what 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 was apparent in the conversations that uh, or had with Marcus Simeon and Corey Seager and even John Gray and Cole Calhoun and, and just the things we've heard. Well, I think it's the whole picture. But one thing that stood out to me is that the Rangers didn't run away from who they were last year and who they have been uh, and in being very transparent. Hey, we're not going to try and put makeup, whatever the saying, and put makeup on an animal or a pig or whatever. I don't know what it is. I'm bad at those. But, you know, the Rangers weren't trying to just put makeup on uh, the 2021 season, you know, they, you know, they came out and, and it, it appeared in, in their conversations with the free agents and said, listen, we're the Texas Rangers. We lost 102 games this year. We own that. We own that. We have not been competitive over the last few years, but we also are here to let you know that we don't find that acceptable. And that's not the direction we intend on, on going, or uh, that's not a path down which we intend on continuing. Uh, and I think that probably had an impact you know it wasn't like we're going to ignore what just happened we're going to address it head on this is why it went down that way and this is what we're going to do to change it i think the facilities did make a difference uh hearing what marcus simeon and john gray and cole calhoun and, and Corey seager said you know it, and it's not just the ballpark it's not just the roof it's not just the you know how much players love playing in this ballpark it's the amenities that come with the ballpark it's the the money that's been invested in research and development, the training facilities, stuff of that nature, that made a difference. Uh, I don't think that all four players would bring it up in, in their own, what appear to be genuine ways if, if that wasn't the case. Uh, I think the, the outlook, you know, it was interesting hearing Marcus Simeon talk about the prospects and his, uh, his desire to, to really, you know, impact the veterans, but impact the prospects. Uh, and, you know, Corey Seager talking about, you know, his, his, his research and the organization and getting an understanding of, of where they are now, but what, what's in the minors and, uh, and having an idea that, Hey, this is an organization on the, on the come. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the, the money, let's not, you know, let's not uh, act like they were going to come here for free. The Rangers stepped up. 
and they stepped up in a big way. Let's quickly go through the four free agents. One thing I want to say about really all four, but specifically uh, Seeger and Simeon, and, and maybe right below them, uh, Cole Calhoun, the leadership stuff, the, the, the presence in the room, uh, the culture building, that stuff's real. Can't quantify it, but I can tell you that stuff is real. It matters and it makes a difference. And those guys are all going to be big parts of that. Uh, Cole Calhoun is already rallying players together for those who live out in Arizona, especially during this, this lockout, which players can't interact with the coaches, the front office, but players can interact with players. Uh, you know, Corey Seager is not a big raw, raw speech guy, but he is a watch me go about uh, my work and, and my commitment every single pitch, every single day, uh, a leader in that way. Marcus Simeon's the guy who he'll put your arms around you or his, or his arm around you. He'll, he'll give you that speech. He'll talk to you if he needs to. But these are all guys who are, are highly respected in that regard. I had a, a player tell me that Marcus Simeon is the best leader he has ever been around. Uh, and this is someone who's been in the, the majors for more than 10 years and has been around a lot of different players. Uh, that stuff's real. That stuff matters. I'm not going to go into greater depths with that because I can feel some of you rolling your eyes. And it's one of those things where, you know, in, in June, July of this year, two, three years down the road, you'll come back and say, right, you know what? I remember when Jared and other people were, were talking about this and I get it. I see it. Uh, Corey Seager, he's dealt with some injuries, but not the type of injuries that would concern you, say, like a, a Carlos Correa. And I, I was very adamant. I, you know, I think Carlos Correa is a special player. Uh, he's had back issues, and back issues are troublesome. And I, I think perhaps that's one reason why the Rangers didn't go all in for Carlos Correa. Corey Seager's injuries are a little different. You got a, you know, a broken hand getting hit by a pitch. You get Tommy John, uh, stuff that, you know, especially Tommy John for a position player is not a big deal. Uh, you know, there are questions about whether he's a shortstop long-term, maybe he moves to third. He's going to play short. Now, you know, it's worth noting that with the analytics and the shifting and the strategy that comes into play, you can hide, uh, some of the weaknesses for a particular player defensively, especially when he's paired with a middle infield partner in Marcus Simeon, who's a gold glove second baseman. What Corey Seager is, is an outstanding offensive player. Uh, he's a left-handed hitter who very notably is very good against left-handed pitching. So platoon advantages aren't going to have nearly the impact. It makes it harder for opposing managers to kind of game plan late in the game. And it's one reason why Corey Seager uh, is a very good hitter late in the game when a lot of guys fall victim to matchups and 100 mile an hour relievers who throw from the same side with a nasty slider. Corey Seager last year in Woba, which is one particular statistic that front offices value weighted on base average. He had the fourth highest Woba among left-handed hitters against left-handed pitching. And then if you just want to look at the raw numbers, the stuff that's a little easier uh, to comprehend, we can do that too. Uh, I tweeted some of this stuff out at Jared Sandler on Twitter, uh, but Corey Seager, uh, if you want to look at last year uh, against or last two years against lefties, 884 OPS compared to a 945 OPS against righties, but 884 is an all-star caliber OPS with a 310 batting average actually had a higher batting average against lefties than righties in his career. Uh, he's a 281 hitter, about 25 points lower against lefties than righties. The OPS about a hundred points lower, but he's made adjustments over the last couple of years. Uh, and he has really become a, a, an incredibly tough hitter against left-handed pitching. That's significant. He also doesn't strike out much. He walks, he gets on base. He's a tough out. Marcus Simeon is a tough out. These are not guys who are huge swing and miss strikeout guys. These are guys who are going to compete and be sons of guns in the middle of that lineup for other pitchers to get out. When they do, they're going to have to earn it. It's not going to be three pitches in a cloud of dust uh, very often. And what it also allows is that when you have those two guys, you're building your lineup around those two guys. Now, if you were to add back a Joey Gallo next year in free agency, who is a swing and miss guy, he walks a lot. It's for a lot of power, but he's going to hit 210, 220, you know, presumably with a lot of strikeouts. But when you're not building a lineup around that, that all of a sudden looks a lot different. But you've got to have Seager. You've got to have Simeon in order to establish that foundation. The Rangers have been searching for that, and they've got it in these two guys. I think Corey Seager's a guy who, you know, of the shortstops who've been talked about, he's realized the most success offensively. You want to, you know, talk about big games, tough pitching. Guy won a World Series MVP. That's all you need to know. Uh, Marcus Simeon, uh, he's a guy who over the last couple of years has really improved his ability to pull the ball and get the ball in the air. He's 
uh, decrease his ground ball numbers, increase his fly ball numbers. That's a big reason why his home run numbers have jumped. Uh, you know, he's an, another guy who's going to hit for good average, uh, you know, especially these days. He hit 265 last year. Uh, Major League average was uh, about 20 points or so below that. Uh, an OPS near 900. Uh, this is a guy that, uh, you know, he's twice in his last two full seasons has scored well over 100 runs. Uh, that's a combination of base running, uh, base hitting, uh, and just your total offensive package. This is a really good hitter. Again, a tough out. He struck out 146 times in 162 games. That used to be a high number. That's not anymore. Guys who strike out less than uh, once per game are among the tougher guys in Major League Baseball to strike out. And he also walked 66 times. So he's, he's getting on base three years ago, or I guess three seasons ago. In 2019, he walked 87 times. So tough outs. Love that. Marcus Simeon came up. He was uh, a below average defensive shortstop, worked with Ron Washington, mentioned the other day, Ron Washington is probably the most important baseball man in his life. Uh, Wash turned him into a, a, an above average shortstop and Marcus Simeon played second last year in Toronto and won a gold glove. And that's probably his best position. I remember, uh, I feel like when I saw him in college at Cal, I think he played second base a lot. And I know that uh, it's something he did coming out of Cal early in the White Sox organization coming up through the minors before he ended up going to Oakland. I believe in the Jeff Samarja trade, but I, I could be wrong. Uh, Marcus Simeon, by the way, just want a little, little nugget, not wearing the number 10. Uh, Michael Young has that number retired, obviously, wearing the number two. is his dad's uh, college football number. When uh, his dad, who also went to Cal, played football uh, for the Cal Bears. John Gray, interesting, uh, interesting case here. You look at his overall numbers. And they're not, they're not going to jump off the page. You know, it's a guy with a career 459 ERA. Let's remember, his entire career has been spent pitching for the Colorado Rockies. One thing I like is that he's actually had success at Coors Field. And you might think, well, if he's had success at Coors Field, then what's the excuse? I think what people don't realize sometimes is that the impact of going from Coors Field elsewhere, back to Coors Field elsewhere, it, it's tough for hitters and pitchers because pitches – respond differently in the altitude than away from it. You know, I remember talking to David Dahl last year who briefly played for the Rangers. And he said that really what was tough uh, was sometimes coming back to Coors Field after being on the road, as great as the altitude is, all of a sudden these sharp breaking balls aren't breaking as much, but it also made it super tough on the road because now those pitches that we saw are so much better. Well, it's the reverse for pitchers, uh, you know, John Gray and, and pitchers, they want consistency. Well, yeah, maybe their slider's not as good in Colorado, but, you know, they have to make adjustments to the way they throw it. And now they're pitching in St. Louis. Uh, they're pitching in Los Angeles. They're pitching in Milwaukee. And those pitches aren't going to respond the same. So it's tough for them because they just want the consistency in knowing what a pitch is going to do. Uh, and he, he identified that as a big challenge. So I think, you know, for John Gray, who's got a great slider, a good curveball, uh, and, and a fastball that, that looks like it can be a really, really good pitch, uh, I think going away from Coors Field is going to help him significantly. Like it helps a lot of pitchers. Uh, I think it will help with the consistency. I think it will, will, you know, help mentally too. The Rangers, what should be noted is as much as this organization has had a tough time the last few years, one area they've been really good at is identifying pitchers kind of in that middle of the market area uh, and helping them produce career years. Mike Miner, Lance Lynn, Kyle Gibson. What do those three all also have in common? The fastball is a big part of that. And one of the industry thoughts on John Gray is that his fastball has got the potential to be way better than it has been. And we'll be interested to see what the Rangers do about that. And finally, Cole Calhoun, again, you know, it, it needs to be noted that he is a room guy. This is a guy who is going to help from a leadership standpoint. It's a one-year deal. He's not getting in the way of anyone. Uh, he'll play right field DH a little bit. He'll probably start against righties only and not against lefties. And you know, it's a guy that, you know, you, you could possibly platoon with. Uh, dealt with injuries last year, a, a, a meniscus that led to a compensation injury with the hamstring, which led to a compensation injury with the other hamstring. And it was just a rough year for him. This is a guy who, uh, you know, he's had a nice career. I don't think that Cole Calhoun is necessarily a huge part of the Rangers future. Uh, he signed a one-year deal, but this is a guy that over his career is a tough out from 2016 uh, through 2019, a four-year stretch, all with the Angels. He averaged around 70 walks per year. That's a, a, a guy who's going to get on base. That's a guy who, uh, over his career, is uh, about a league average on base guy. But uh, the difference between batting average on base is, is a little bit better than league average. You know, the, 
uh, the ability to get on base when he is and when he is not getting hits. And he's a guy who, you know, he, he's going to hit for some power, not, not big time power, some power, but I think his, his biggest presence is just going to be a veteran who goes about things the right way. Again, is a, a veteran who's played with some great players. I mean, he played with Mike Trout. He's played with Shohei Otani uh, and, and can put his arm around folks and, and explain his experiences and what he's gathered from other players. So uh, that's what the Rangers have done. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's just a general understanding of what the last uh, few days have yielded. Now we got this lockout and we'll, uh, we'll pick it back up afterwards, but looking forward to talking more Rangers baseball with you all. Uh, talk to you soon. Have a great day.